Joseph of Springfield, Sister Joan Reisowitz, and all of the Sisters of St. Joseph here today. And then we have Chickpea, Richard Koss, as well as our distinguished speaker for today, Sister Mary Johnson. As we start, I would like to say thank you to, for the, to the lecture series planning committee and the members of the Office of Institutional Advancement, in particular Bernadette Norkowski, for all they did to prepare for today. Thank you very much. What a wonderful gathering this is today. Students, faculty, staff, men and women religious, and the wider community. This afternoon, we come together to celebrate Reverend Hugh Crean, an individual who has made a lasting impact on the Diocese of Springfield and the entire Western Massachusetts. Reverend Crean was an esteemed and respected professor of religious studies at the College of Our Lady of the Elms in the 1970s, and it is very fitting that we meet on the Elms campus today to celebrate his legacy. To start today's program, Alyssa Mercado, criminal justice major in the class of 2020, will give the opening prayer. Alyssa. God of many names, we gather at Thanksgiving this day as we honor Reverend Hugh Crean, beloved professor, theologian, advisor, and friend to many people in the Diocese of Springfield. We are indeed blessed with Sister Mary Johnson as she brings her wisdom to this gathering with her words of inspiration to enlighten us on the values and vision of Catholic women in the United States. We are grateful too to our founding community, the Sisters of St. Joseph, for their vision and commitment to continuously impart to all their charism, that we all may work and live to be united with God and with each other without distinction. Loving God, as you have led us in the past, lead us now into the future to continue to remain committed to our college's core values of faith, justice, community, and excellence so that we may envision a world in which the voices of all are heard that we may be in greater communion with you and with each other. We ask all this through the intercession of Mary, who is Our Lady of the Elms, and through Jesus Christ, our brother. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Melissa. It is now my pleasure to introduce the president of Elms College, Dr. Harry DeMay. Harry E. DeMay, PhD, MBA, is the 11th president of the College of Our Lady of the Elms. He has served at senior and executive levels in higher education finance and administration for 19 years, including at St. Anselm College, Harvard, Univers Harvard University's Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, Boston College's Graduate School of Social Work, and Boston University School of Engineering. In addition, Dr. DeMay served for nine years as a Boston College adjunct faculty member. Dr. DeMay currently serves as a commissioner, treasurer, member of the executive committee, and member of the annual report on finance and enrollment committee for the New England Commission of Higher Education. He also serves on the boards of the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities in Massachusetts, the Student Aid Policy Committee for the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, the Boston Foundation's Haiti Development Institute, and as a board member for the Boston-based Youth and Family Enrichment Services, and the World Affairs Council of Western Massachusetts. Dr. DeMay. Thank you, Walter, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the inaugural Reverend Hugh Cream Distinguished Lecture. We are truly excited this afternoon to launch this endowed lecture series to honor in perpetuity a great servant of the church by putting our institution at the service of the Diocese of Springfield. 
This is indeed a celebration of the spirit of service, very much in keeping with the example of our founders, the Sisters of St. Joseph. Through five decades in the priesthood, Father Hugh Green was a compassionate and respected pastor, professor, theologian, and advisor. He devoted himself to the pastoral care, spiritual leadership, and education of the people of Western Massachusetts, and as a result, touched the lives of thousands in the diocese. Here at the Elms, he was an extraordinary professor of religious studies from 1973 to 1979. Many on the campus recall his wisdom, his depth as a theologian, and his profound ability to share the message of the gospel. A group of generous benefactors, led by Jack Dill, a dear friend of the college, wanted to honor the legacy of Father Hugh Green. At the same time, the college wanted to find a way to open to the entire diocese our ongoing efforts to advance the Catholic intellectual tradition. Those two objectives came hand in glove and made the thought of a distinguished lecture series in honor of Father Hugh Crean necessary. Through this endowed series, each year, we will invite a national leader in theology, ethics, or philosophy to our campus to lecture on a topic that highlights the richness of Catholic thought. To plan this year's inaugural session, as Walter mentioned, we formed a committee which included, among others, Sister June Reiseritz, Father Mark Stelzer, Father Warren Sa Savage. It took the committee less than 30 seconds to agree <laughs> unanimously that Sister Mary Johnson, the sister of Notre Dame de Namur, would be our ideal inaugural speaker. A distinguished professor of sociology and religious studies at Trinity Washington University in Washington, D.C., Sister Mary Johnson's record of high-level scholarly work and academic leadership fits well with the profile of the national scholar whom we envision. But more than that, her personal connection to Father Hugh Crane makes her uniquely appropriate for our inaugural lecture. When Sister Mary was in grammar and high school, Father Hugh Green was in residence at her home parish, Sacred Heart in Springfield. Father Hugh was highly influential in her decision to enter the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur, and they remained friends throughout his life. The topic that she chose for today reflects her academic interests, which include the sociology of religion, Catholic religious orders of women, Catholic social teaching, generations in Catholicism, women in the church, and U.S. Catholic demographics. She has authored three books in the field, but she also chose the topic because she knows that it was one that was close to Father Hugh Crean's heart. As a gift to the entire Downs College community, Sister Mary just gave me this afternoon a copy of her latest book. Her inscription in the book captures perfectly the spirit that moves us this afternoon. She wrote to the Elms College community in gratitude for your vibrant expression of the Catholic intellectual tradition. We are honored to have Sister Mary Johnson with us today to deliver the inaugural Reverend Hugh Crane Distinguished Lecture. I look forward to hearing her perspective on Catholic women in the United States, values and vision. Thank you all for being here to share this magnificent afternoon with us. As we, as we examine how faith and reason come together to help us all lead more purposeful lives. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Uh, the program indicates that my job is to provide a remembrance of Hugh Graham, uh, which is a complete waste of time. Anyone who ever knew you uh, will not forget him. So, rather than that, on behalf of the Graham family, uh, his legion of friends, admirers, and countless parishioners who benefited from his unique pastoral gifts, I would like to thank President Dumay, the trustees of the Elms, and the organizers of the Reverend Hugh Crean Distinguished Lecture Series for their efforts to bring this idea forward. The recognition of Father Hugh's contribution to theology of the Elms is so appropriate. His time here was indeed very important to him, allowing him to exercise his considerable intellectual and theological self as he gave so much of his energy, care, and human kindness to his role as a simple priest, which was truly his only ambition. It seems fitting in this initial lecture uh, be given, that it be given by such a distinguished religious woman. Hugh's respect for and dependence upon his female colleagues here at the Elms and throughout his vocation was well known. That such an accomplished theologian and academic agreed to inaugurate this series is a fitting acknowledgement of the College of Our Lady of the Elms uh, and Reverend Crean. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Johnson, and I'm not sure which is the more distinguished title, doctor or sister. Uh, and we're looking forward to her remarks. So Dr. Sister Johnson, I believe uh, the podium is yours. I would now like to invite Father Mark Stelzer, college chaplain and associate professor of humanities here at the college, to introduce today's speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. And how wonderful to see so many people from the college family and so many members of the Korean family that honor us by their presence today. Uh, seeing the member of Hughes families here brings back so many happy memories. As we come together for this inaugural lecture in honor of Father McCrean, who was a mentor and dear friend of mine during my years in the seminary, and later as a doctoral student and resident at Sacred Heart in Springfield, it's a particular honor for me to introduce Sister Mary Johnson. Long before she became known as Sister Mary, Mary and I were classmates at Sacred Heart Grammar School in Springfield. <laughs> Graduating from that grammar school in 1971, Mary and I, without really knowing it, were witnesses to profound changes taking place in the life of the church and in religious life itself. At a very young age, Mary and I were blessed to be part of a school and a parish community which was already welcoming an increasingly diverse student body and parishioner base as urban renewal had begun to make changes in the face of Springfield's North End. As seventh and eighth grader, our teachers, the Sisters of Notre Dame, urged us to join them and the wonderful parish priest assigned to Sacred Heart in responding to the needs of the growing Latino population. To this day, I have countless wonderful memories of after school and summer hours spent with Mary in a storefront on the corner of Chestnut and Carew Streets, which was the first home to the Spanish apostolate, tutoring young people in the primary grades. From the Sisters of Notre Dame and from wonderful priests like Father Guprian and Father George Farlam and Father Don Mullen. Mary and I were blessed at a very young age to become part of a parish community that became for us and so many of our contemporaries a true school of ministry. We now fast forward 48 years. <laughs> Sister Mary Johnson is a member of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur and a distinguished professor of both sociology and religious studies at Trinity Washington University in Washington, D.C. At Trinity, she is also the co-director 
of the Villiard Center for Social Justice. And prior to joining the faculty of Trinity, Mary was on the faculty of Emanuel College of Boston. Sister Mary holds an MA and a PhD in Sociology from the University of Massachusetts and a BA from Emanuel College. She speaks nationally and internationally on issues related to Catholicism, religious life, and Catholic social teaching. She's authored numerous articles and has co-authored three books, Young Adult Catholics, New Generations of Catholic Sisters, and her most recent book, which was published last month by Oxford University Press, Migration Permission, International Catholic Sisters in the United States. I was delighted to find in that this latest book, Mary features her own grand aunt, Sister Margaret Claire Johnson, who migrated from Ireland for a mission and entered the Sisters of St. Joseph of Springfield in 1917. I'd ask you all to please join me in welcoming home to her beloved Springfield and to this campus, Sister Mary Johnson. Nice to be home. Thank you to our distinguished guests. Thank you, Father Mark, for that beautiful introduction. As you were talking about our shared memories, I was thinking about the fact that I've been thinking about those memories over the last several weeks since President Dume extended his wonderful invitation to me. And as you were recounting those memories of our growing up years, all I could think of is that's exactly what I want our young Catholics to have today. So I put this talk together in light of those wonderful memories and also in light of the themes of Father Hugh Crean's life that I think animate both our thoughts and our conversations within the church and within our society right now. And so let me present to you some of those themes that I saw in him as a young person when I was at Sacred Heart, when he was in residence, then later when he became co-pastor with Father George, and then later when he assumed other ministries. So first, as I recall him, and as I look at our society, I would say that he was dialogical and not ideological. Now, in sociology, we use a metaphor to describe ideology. And the metaphor is that of scaffolding. So if you think about going down to Chicopee Center or downtown Springfield, and if you see scaffolding outside a building, taking up a lot of space on a sidewalk, that's what we would say ideology is. A person who's ideological is trapped inside scaffolding. They have a particular view of reality, but it's limited, and it doesn't allow one to go beyond and see life outside of that frame. Hugh Crean was not ideological. He was deeply dialogical. He did not fear new ideas, new people, or a new sense of social reality. He was willing to, in Pope Francis's words, encounter people. He respected their life experience. He respected the action of God in their lives. And he proceeded through these encounters with grace. He was a man of uncommon grace. Secondly, I would say he was not a cynic. The phrase is that skeptics have a lot of questions, but cynics have all the answers. He was not cynical. Instead, he was a man of great hope because he believed that the church is God's church and that the Holy Spirit moves through our lives as individuals and our life as a community. And he trusted God. 
Next, he was rooted and he was grounded. I asked him shortly before I entered my own order if he had ever thought about becoming a man religious, if he had thought about going into a religious order for men. And he said no, he wanted to be a diocesan priest because, quote, he wanted to be firmly planted among the people. And so, rooted, grounded, planted, his roots allowed him then to think big, to think beyond, to reach out. And I think that his experience of parish life allowed him then to realize the depth and breadth and power of what the organization of a parish is within Catholicism. Next, he had the profound gift of being able to relate to all generations of people and people from all backgrounds. One of the gifts of Catholicism to our society is that it crosses all social lines. It crosses all generational, social class, educational level. It can transcend a lot of the deep division that we experience today. But in addition to the fact that he could relate to all generations, he had a particular gift of being able to relate to the young. And Mark and I certainly were the beneficiaries of that. He took us seriously. He listened to our questions. He encouraged us. He inspired us. And finally, Hugh Crean had an unwavering belief in the ministry of women. He recognized and applauded women's gifts and women's talents and women's perspectives. He was not threatened by women. He instead embraced the gifts of women in the church and beyond. He embraced those gifts for the sake of the church's very mission and for the sake of the church itself. So I chose the data that I'll present to you shortly from three different data sources in light of those themes. And I would say that another dimension to his being that I think we should lift up today and use in our analysis is that as a priest, he had a tremendous belief in God's action a tremendous ability to comprehend the movement of the Holy Spirit across the church, and a deep wisdom and understanding of human life and human fallibility. So, let me turn now to, I always worry at this moment. Let me turn and click and thank God. <laughs> So, we're not naive. You and I know that there are multiple challenges facing the church. Uh, they face, many of them, they face the whole society, they face the world society. So I want to lift up a few that I want to pay particular attention to as we move through this presentation. The first is that we are at a time of deep polarization. So the young people today are growing up in a very different time than Mark and I grew up. Survey data shows us that there's practically no coming together over any topic. That's really unusual. So when we were younger, we had Representative Silvio Conti and Representative Eddie Boland, a Republican and a Democrat who had such regard for each other, such respect for each other, they differed, certainly, on various issues, but there was no acrimony. When I tell the students in Washington about that time, they look at me like I have five heads. It's not in their experience to see people with different points of view and different philosophies, different life experiences, finding common ground. So, the church, unfortunately, also experiences some of that deep polarization. 
We're also facing what some people call twin crises in the church as we work through this very difficult moment in the church's life. One, one piece of the crisis is obviously the sex abuse crisis, the abuse of minors, and also the harassment of vulnerable adults. The other dimension of the crisis is the leadership that failed us at various points in the church's journey through this crisis. So that is the backdrop for, again, the socialization, particularly of the young. The third is a trend that we see across many religious traditions in the U.S. right now, and it's called the rise in nuns, N-O-N-E-S's. And those are people when pollsters call and ask what is their political party, what is their age, what is their occupation, what is their religion, they respond to that question saying, none, I'm not religiously affiliated. Now some people presume that nuns are atheists or agnostic. That's not the case. Most nuns believe in God, they believe often in many of the teachings and symbol systems of their religious traditions, but they do not like the structures and sometimes the um, lack, in, relative, particularly to women, the lack of a role for women in governance and authority and decision making in their religious traditions. We see in Catholicism a developing number of nuns. Next, we know that women often carry the faith from generation to generation in their family. We have seen evidence that in the last several years, there has been an increase in religious fervence, fervor among Catholic women since the election of Pope Francis. Prior to that, survey data from 25 years previous showed a decline in religious commitment among women. While we see this increase in religious fervor among women and commitment and engagement, we have particular concern, though, about young women because some, again, having grown up in this time period, have tremendous issues and concerns and hurts from the church and from other religious bodies. And then finally, Catholics in particular are called to do difficult balancing act. Many of them do it, some cannot do it, and they leave. The balancing act is the deep appreciation most Catholics have for the mission of the church, and many, many non-Catholics have for the mission of the church. Since our mission extends all over the world, we have not just our spiritual mission, but in following the gospel, we are seen as the largest humanitarian organization in the world. We can minister in places that most other groups can't even enter. One example of that is North Korea. The most closed society in the church allows Catholic Relief Services in to minister to the North Korean people. So on that universal level, there's tremendous engagement, tremendous appreciation. In terms of Francis's pontificate, his ministry to migrants and his concern for global migration, and secondly, the tremendous appeal of Laudato Si, his environmental encyclical, and some are saying it is the most influential encyclical since Rerum Navarum in 1891. All of that is moving forward, but it can be undermined, and it is undermined, by some of the church's internal structures. The undermining of our moral authority on the global level, on the national level, and the local level by some of our own structures, which in many cases um, are not responding to the signs of the times. So with that as a backdrop, and again continuing to think about Ukraine's own vision, we turn to the first part of this presentation, which is the question of who are Catholic women in the U.S. today? First, by region of the country, the church is growing in the South and the West. 
just like the U.S. population is. However, the church still is a very significant presence in the Northeast and the Midwest. About a quarter of Catholics are in the Northeast. Now, sometimes the Catholic mentality in the Northeast is such that you would think there are no Catholics at all in the Northeast. But there are millions of us. It's just that our structures don't fit our needs in the same way that they did 50 years ago. 50 years ago, Catholics in the Northeast were 40% of the U.S. Catholic population. Now we're 26%. So how do we realign our thinking, just like we would for our family home? What fits the present reality? By age, there's tremendous diversity. When we compare ourselves to some of the other Christian churches in the United States, we are much younger. Not counted on this slide are the tens of millions of Catholic children and teenagers. So we are considered, these are the other traditions, a young church. Now you might say, that sure, it sure doesn't look like that in my mass, in my local parish. So then we have to ask, well then where are those young Catholics and how do we respond to them? In terms of race and ethnicity, there's tremendous diversity. 57% of Catholic women are white, 35% are Hispanic, 3% are black, 3% Asian, 1% Middle Eastern, 1% Native American, 1% are two or more mixed races, non-Hispanic. Now, the fastest growing ethnic group in the church is the Asian population. The largest ethnic group in the church, obviously, is the Hispanic. The Asians are called by demographers the New Irish. And they're called the New Irish because when we look at novitiates and seminaries, we see a high proportion of Asian seminarians and novices. And those seminarians and novices primarily have roots in Vietnam, the Philippines, or Korea. One of the things that we are dealing with now and this is thanks to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, a new pastoral letter on racism. Some argue that it didn't go far enough, but there are elements in that letter that I use at Trinity that are extraordinarily important and that my students have deeply appreciated. My students of color are very grateful for the strong statements made in that letter about racism. And one of the questions that we raise is how do we confront the racism in our own church? How do we make certain that all people are welcome into all of our church structures, parishes and hospitals and social service centers, religious orders, seminaries, and beyond? Just as the society is struggling with the question of racism, so too is our church. We see great diversity, too, in the marital status of Catholic women. 46% are married to a Catholic, 17% married to someone who is not Catholic, 15% have never been married, 10% separated or divorced, 6% widowed, 6% are living with a partner. So about one-third of the Catholic women in this country are not married. And we always have to ask the question, what do our structures look like? Do our structures welcome people of all uh, marital statuses? Or is there a truncated version of what uh, one must be like and relative to being in a couple? And is that how some parishes respond uh, to women? We've heard a lot as we did research on uh, some, the exclusion that some people felt in their parishes due to their marital status. 
The 6% who live with a partner, for some, that's a partner of the opposite sex, for some, that's a partner of the same sex. Are they welcomed into our Catholic institutions? As, uh, again, as the teaching of the church asks us to. Next, employment status. Almost 60% of Catholic women are employed, either as paid employees or as self-employed workers. Now, going back a few decades, many religions in the U.S. depended on female labor, women who were not working. That's not the system today. So how do we design new kinds of systems whereby people who work, people who are not working now, can share their giftedness with the church community? In terms of household income, Catholics are among the poorest people in the United States. Catholics are among the wealthiest people in the United States. We cross every social class line. One of the ways that, one of the contributions that Catholicism has made to the U.S., not just to fellow Catholics, but to the whole U.S., is through our school system, we have lifted people up a social class. That is unheard of. So that's a major contribution that the church has given to the country and that it continues to give to the country. By education, again, tremendous diversity. 14% of Catholic women have less than a high school education, all the way up to 12% having either a master's degree or a professional or doctoral degree. Now, how do we take that tremendous diversity, that range of experience, that incredible giftedness, and bring it to the church in new ways? So the second part of this conversation helps us look at the vision that some people have for Catholic women. Now certainly Catholic women have a vision for their life in the church, but I wanted to lift up some visions that you may not be familiar with. So, I want to start on the bottom of this slide. Recent gatherings of lay leaders which I've attended. The first is called the Leadership Summit. It was held in Washington, D.C. a couple of months ago. It was attended by three cardinals, Cardinal O'Malley of Boston, Cardinal Supich of Chicago, Cardinal Tobin of New Jersey, of Newark, and about 200 lay leaders. We had uh, presentations, and then we did a lot of conversation at our tables. I was so struck by men and women saying the same thing over and over again, and it being reported back from the tables to the large group. Consistently, they said they want more lay involvement in the leadership and the decision making of the church. And they particularly want the voice of women in that decision making. Secondly, another major chord in that conversation was concern about seminary formation. While they felt that many young men were sincerely entering into seminary preparation, they had concerns about the curriculum in seminaries, about the fact that in some seminaries, no women professors are hired to teach the seminarians. No women serve as administrators. Women do not serve as spiritual directors. The concern is evidenced in certain surveys which show that some seminarians get what is called a cultic, they become, uh, after ordination, what are called cultic priests in that they are so um, concerned with outward appearances, with ritual practices, and in survey research again, many of them do not feel they want to work with women or that they feel that women have 
gifts they could bring to parish life. Now the opposite of a cultic priesthood is what's called a servant leadership priesthood. And we have many examples of magnificent priests who espouse that kind of leadership among us. They serve in the spirit of the gospel. The concern was about the preparation of these men. What is happening or not happening in seminaries that then produce young men who will have tremendous difficulty once they are sent on mission to their parishes. Now, survey research also tells us that the majority of tasks in parish life are done by women. So if a young man doesn't want to work with women, and most of the work is done by women, what will happen to that parish? So I was struck by the depth of honesty, the depth of concern. There were seminary rectors there who spoke very honestly. There were very informed and engaged lay people who were deeply concerned about the availability of the sacraments in the future about the quality of the priesthood in the future, about the, uh, the strength of parish life in the future. So that meeting was followed by another meeting called the OMI Partnership. The OMI, it's a, a, a congregation of men religious, the Oblates of Mary Immaculate. They're based in San Antonio, and they have a partnership with their lay associates every year. They take on a difficult issue, this year it was, uh, the sex abuse crisis in the church. They, uh, they and the Leadership Summit sent all of this material to the Bishop's Conference. It's available to the wider community. I can leave those links in President Dumais' office for you if you wish to read those two reports. But at this meeting too, it was amazing to see lay men stand up talking about the need for lay women to be in leadership. Now the lay women had already thought that and agreed with that, but coming from the lay men, uh, it, it seemed to uh, be almost stunning because it seemed to a lot of us who were gathered there that we were at a very new moment in the church. And as difficult it is to face this crisis, out of this crisis is coming some whole new ways to think and envision the structure of the church for the sake of the mission of the church. So uh, that particular meeting also focused on seminary life and seminary preparation. And several people at both meetings talked about a new model for priestly formation which would be grounded in Catholic colleges and Catholic universities. So just like some religious orders of men are formed with lay people and receive their master's degree with lay people in mixed classrooms, male and female professors, male and female administrators, a lot of these concerned lay people were saying, could not that be the model for priestly formation for the future? So that, those are some dimensions of the vision that some lay people have as we go forward. Another vision comes from the recent Synod of Bishops on Young People, Faith and Vocational Discernment, held last autumn in the Vatican, to which several bishops and many young people attended. A document has been produced from that uh, meeting, and there are many, many elements discussed in that document. It's a very beautiful document. It talks about the holiness of young people. And it talks about their engagement in the church. And it often refers to what they said at the meeting. So I talked to a sister who was an auditor at that meeting, and she described how amazing it was. The bishops listening to the young people the young people listening to the bishops in a true dialogue. And she said at one point, a young man from Nigeria got up and addressed the bishops, and he said, I need male role models for my faith journey. 
but I also need female role models. So it's important to note that this is not just a U.S. experience, and those of us in international religious orders know that often people say, oh, those are those Americans again, talking like that. But we know that this is now a phenomenon in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, as well as Europe and North America, where younger people are rising up with a new vision for the church. So I wanted, in this section, to lift out words from the document. And this document was sent to Pope Francis, and Pope Francis has responded in his most recent apostolic exhortation. So let's read the, this, these phrases first. So, paragraph 55. The young also clamor for greater recognition and greater valuing of women in society and women in the church. The absence of the feminine voice and perspective impoverishes debate and the church's journey, depriving discernment of a precious contribution. And it continues. A church that seeks to live a synodal style cannot fail to reflect on the condition and role of women within it, and consequently in society more generally. Young men and women ask this question forcefully. It continues. The fruits of such reflection need to be implemented through a courageous change of culture and through change in daily pastoral practice. A sphere of particular importance in this regard is the female presence in ecclesial bodies at all levels, including positions of responsibility, as well as female participation in ecclesial decision-making processes, respecting the role of the ordained minister. This is a duty of justice, which draws inspiration both from the way Jesus related to men and women of his day, and from the importance of the role of certain female figures in the Bible, in the history of salvation, and in the life of the church. So everything I said previous to this, you may have thought, oh, she's a liberal. But now that I show you this, this came from a synod. Now, Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation in response to the synod and to the synod document is absolutely beautiful. It too, gives us a magnificent vision. It's been criticized, however, for not giving a how and what to how we'll put this into action. But what I would say today as a sociologist is, that's where we are. This is a 1.3 billion member church. Almost every country in the world is Catholics in it. So this is our moment to all of us discern the how and the what. How does this go forward? The place that Hugh Crean put so much of his intellectual and pastoral concern was in the parish. So I lift up for you what the document says about parish life. While parishes remain the primary and principal way constituting the church. They struggle to appeal to young people and their missionary vocation. Thus struggle to appeal to young people and their missionary vocation needs to be rethought. The life and activities of the young often flow past the community without really encountering it. And again, going back to Pope Francis' notion of true encounter. The young are going this way, the parish is over here, they are not, in many cases, connecting. That impoverishes the young, 
and it also impoverishes the parish and those of us who were reared in parishes and believe in parish life. Now, what does the church say about the roles for women in parish life? If this is, as the document says, a constitutive institution of the universal church. Sociologically, if this is the place where generations can meet, ethnic groups can meet, races can meet, people of different political parties can meet, the rich and the poor can meet, what do we do? Knowing that there is a search out there for what's called a third institution, meaning that so many people today spend most of their life in family and at work. And while those two institutions are deeply meaningful and they consume a lot of our time and energy, many people more and more are saying, I need something else. For the Catholic community, historically, it's been our parish. That's where many of us in this room grew up. That's where many of us had our faith nurtured. And that's where many of us could hear our vocation to our future calling. So, for us, what do we know about women's formal roles in the church? We know that informally, women have, for decades, sacrificed and volunteered on so many levels parish life. But formally, what roles exist? Well, first, the role of the lay ecclesial minister. Since the Second Vatican Council, we've seen a tremendous growth in a role that has provided such pastoral love and concern and support to the parish community and to the priest pastor. We know that 80% of the lay ecclesial ministers, those pastoral ministers in our 17,000 parishes across the United States, are female. That equals 32,000 women. Most of us today could not imagine parish life without a pastoral minister in collaboration with the pastor and with the people, serving needs that are often hidden and sometimes unmet. So that role has provided tremendous graces to the church in the United States over the last several decades. The next role is less well known. It's called the Parish Life Coordinator, or PLC. This role was established in 1983 when the Code of Canon Law was revised, when the Code was brought up to speed to match the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. The Canon 517.2 allows for quote, priestless parishes, to have a deacon serve as the leader of the parish, the administrator of the parish, or someone else, and that's how the code puts it. The someone else can be a sister, a brother, a laywoman, or a layman. When this canon uh, was reflected upon, some bishops in the United States in those early years, in the South and the West and the Midwest in particular, called for sisters and other laywomen uh, to serve. A book was written in the 90s that analyzed the effectiveness of that canon, and the sociologist who wrote that book, Ruth Wallace, went to 20 of those parishes spread across the United States. She interviewed the woman who was serving as the administrator, what we would now call the pastoral life coordinator. She interviewed the priest with whom she was working. There were uh, the, the priests, there's a sacramental presence still, but the priest is not the administrator. He's freed up to do the sacraments and to use his other gifts. And she interviewed two people from the parish council, men and women. She also went to Sunday liturgy, she went to some of the meetings, she went to some of the social events, and then she wrote a very important book. 
In that book, she talked about the successes. She also talked about the human tensions, the misunderstandings and so forth. But she presented two values that she saw as constitutive of this new movement in the church. One was that the women brought a sense of collaborative leadership to their roles. They collaborated with the priests. The priests, almost universally, were in admiration of the woman and grateful to the woman for her administrative and leadership skills. Some of the priests admitted, admitted those weren't their gifts. When they went to the seminary, they wanted to be a priest. They did not want to be a pastor. They wanted to serve, especially in the sacramental ministry. They didn't want to have to lead and administer and do the administrative tasks that are demanded of a small um, organization, and in some cases a large organization called a parish. She collaborated with the lay leaders, she collaborated with the committee members, and she collaborated with people beyond the parish community, sometimes in ecumenical and interfaith uh, settings as well. A second major value was that the sociologist observing her saw that she had a pastoral heart. Her starting point was the person. She did a lot of home visiting. These women often began their ministry with a census of the parish to find out who lives here, what are their needs. She had particular concern for the shut-ins and particular concern for the young. She wanted to engage young people, teenagers, young adults, young couples in parish life. She went out of her way to get to know people by name and to be there when they called. She often had a vision for building community because that was a very important value for her as the leader of the parish. She had a good relationship with the bishop. In some cases, the bishop would have a formal installation ceremony for her to communicate to the people that this role was important, that this parish in his eyes should go on and that, she, that he felt she had the gifts needed. Some of the parishes at first couldn't get used to the fact that they didn't have a priest pastor. They'd always had a priest pastor, and they wished that that could continue. But they realized there was a tremendous shortage of priests in their region of the United States. And for some, it took a while, but they slowly accepted her role. For others, it didn't take a long time at all. They were grateful that she was providing leadership and they were grateful that their parish continued. Ruth predicted in the 90s that this model would continue. But what we saw at a certain point a few years ago was that particular role was filled more and more by deacons. Now deacons are wonderful people, but there was a concern that that was one role where women could demonstrate their leadership, where women could serve. And so, what was very interesting is that at the uh, recent synod in Rome, the Bishop of Bridgeport was there, and he heard the young people asking for women in leadership roles in the church. And so, when a wonderful priest pastor died recently in a parish in Fairfield, Connecticut, he appointed as that pastor's replacement the woman who had been the pastoral minister there for years, who was highly esteemed by the people, who knew the people and was known by the people. And that appointment, and I have to say she's an Emmanuel College graduate, so we're very proud. Um, I think the next one will be an Elms College graduate. Uh, but uh, that appointment made the national news. Why? Because it was a sign of hope. It was good news from the Catholic Church. It especially was in reference to the bishops listening to the young people. It was a response of life and hope. And when it was announced, I remember hearing it on NBC saying, this is something Hugh Crean would love. Now, the next 
role. Let me go back for a second because I have to give you a little intro before I can show you the next slide. Is the whole question of the restoration of the female diaconate. And I use the word restoration because that's used by some people who have studied this phenomenon for years. Those scholars would argue that there is evidence that the early church had deacons and that some of those deacons were women and that that role was and is a very important role of service in our church. Deacons are not meant to be mini priests. Deacons are deacons. So a couple of years ago when Pope Francis was addressing the International Union of Superiors General in Rome, he was asked about the restoration of the female diaconate. And he said to the leaders of women's congregations from all over the world that day that it should be studied, that he was open to a study. And so a few months later, he appointed an international commission to study the question. On the international commission was a North American, and her name is Phyllis Sagano. She's based in, on Long Island. She has written several books about the female diaconate, so she would be considered an expert on this. The commission met several times in Rome over the last couple of years. They have written their report, and they have given it to Pope Francis. So now people are waiting to see how he will respond. I wouldn't want to be Pope for anything in the world right now because the papacy, the episcopacy, and the clergy of our church are under such strain. And the question is, how do we move through this period listening for the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that the decisions we make are for the good of the church and its future? So Pope Francis now uh, may at this very hour be reading that report and a survey was done of Catholic women asking this question and these are Catholic women in the US do you feel the Catholic Church should allow women ages 35 and older to be ordained as permanent deacons 60% said yes 21% said maybe but I'd want to learn more before answering. 7% said no, and 12% said don't know. Now, sociologists reading that data would say, first of all, the most important number there is 7% saying no. In this country right now, and in this church right now, we don't have much agreement about anything. We are so sorted and there's a book called The Big Sort. We are sorted into various camps. There's very little common ground. So for only 7% of Catholic women, with that kind of diversity that I showed you earlier, saying no to the question is truly astounding. And so we'll have to see now, in the uh, near future, how this question will be addressed. But we know there is a phenomenal amount of support in this country and in other places for this question. Finally, the elephant in the room, the topic that you probably thought I would begin talking about, and that is the support for the ordination of women to the priesthood. That question is not on the table, but it is in the minds many people in the Catholic community. So in recent surveys, 62% of Catholic women in the U.S. support the ordination of women to the priesthood. It's equal for Catholic men. So that is another astounding finding. How this will play itself out is similar some people speculate as to how other uh, religions dealt with this question. There is a book called Ordaining Women, and it looks at various traditions. And some of it is from that the energy often comes from the bottom up. It comes from great need and response to great need. 
One of the questions that concerns so many sociologists of Catholicism is the availability of the sacraments as we go forward. They are key to our spiritual life and to our collective identity. More and more places in the United States have less and less access to the sacraments. There are regions in the Southwest in particular where Sunday Mass is on Tuesday night when the priest can get to that particular area. We're seeing tremendous burnout of some outstanding priests who are trying to balance so much and who are spread so thin. This question won't go away. I have given many talks on a Sunday, uh, uh, rather on a Saturday, to a, a group of uh, sisters uh, or to a, a nuns in a monastery, and we we're supposed to meet at nine o'clock for mass and then start, and often the priest can't come. And those sisters have had the Eucharist every day of their religious life. In nursing homes, Catholics who uh, were able to um, participate in Eucharist every day of their life, when they get to a Catholic nursing home, don't have mass every day as residents there. More and more, we hear this conversation, more and more we're seeing survey data that will look precisely at these questions, continue to engage the Catholic community in them, and beg for a response. One of the things about Hugh Crean's intellect was he feared nothing. He did not fear asking hard questions or pursuing the truth as he struggled with difficult answers. The data that I presented to you today, with the exception of the letter from uh, the Synod, the rest of the data all come from the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate at Georgetown University. Those surveys come from the work of great Catholic sociologists. That center is the dream of Cardinal Cushing of Boston. When he came home from the council in 1964, he said, this council, the vision of the Second Vatican Council is so great, we'll need social science to help guide us through how to make this vision real. And so sociologists were trained on two levels. One, to help the church understand itself which we did partly today. It's internal self-understanding. And secondly, to understand its external mission to the whole world, because in many ways, the church is desperately needed by the world right now, in ways it hasn't been needed in a long time. The papacy alone is desperately needed, because on the international stage, that's the only religious voice that can speak back to some of the largest and most powerful leaders and organizations in the world. So Pope Francis can call the leaders of the petroleum industry of the world to the Vatican to talk about climate change. And he can have an ecumenical or interfaith prayer with the leaders of the major world religions. And we, as Catholics, often think, oh, that's normal. No, that's extraordinary. And so how do we, in our analysis of the, from the tools of social science, discern, with the help of theologians, the path forward? One of the things that we hear more and more from these lay groups is the word co-responsibility, that together, laity, religious, clergy, bishops, and the Pope form a new way through synodality to plan and execute our dream for the church. And our dream for the church is to follow the gospel and to serve the world. So thinking of Pope of Hugh Crean again and his vision, I would just say that, Lord, we thank you for the gift of Hugh Crean's life and ministry among us. We thank you, Lord, for his time with us, his love for us, and we thank you for his enduring inspiration. Amen.
been asked to answer a couple of questions, and we have a few moments for that. And uh, I believe that um, some of the students are picking up those cards from you right now, and I'll be happy to receive a couple. The question is, uh, when will the Pope ordain women to the ethnics? I don't know. <laughs> we shall see. And uh, thank you. We need a lot of prayer and a lot of action, a lot of study, a lot of discussion, and a lot of this kind of engagement in our Catholic colleges and universities facing tremendous issues that face our church. So to see the young people here today, the students of the Elms, is really a sight to behold. In collecting data, uh, did people self-identify as Catholic? That's one of the wonderful pluses that's going on out there right now. We always have to remember that this society right now is so polarized and also, in many ways, we're getting smaller and smaller in our groupings. So we are uh, just involving ourselves often with people who think just like we do and who reinforce what we believe. So one of the really great uh, findings is that uh, still over 70 million people self-identify as Catholic. Now, how they practice their Catholicism is another question. So we know that weekly mass attendance is down from 50 years ago. And we know that monthly mass attendance is now the norm in the US. What we also know, however, is people are not saying they do not believe in the Eucharist. They don't believe in God's presence in the Eucharist, that they don't believe in coming together as a Eucharistic community. What they do say is their son has a sports program, or they have to work an extra shift, or they can't get there because their mother-in-law is ill. So those are really important findings. That's not to be taken lightly. And then the question for us is, all right, how do we do this so that the mission, again, of a Eucharistic community can, can be brought to people who desire it, but often can't find it themselves for whatever reason? What can we do as lay people to influence making major changes reality? Well, there was a lot of work done prior to the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council just didn't drop out of the sky. The years of thinking, of writing, of preparing, of discussing, uh, that's what today is about. I think that's what this lecture series is about. I think that's what the Elms is about. That we have to take our responsibility seriously as baptized members of this church. And one of the things that I think has happened is that we have handed over a lot of our authority. We have not um, done the study that we should have done. And I see in lots of these places, especially in these gatherings of committed lay people, a lot of that starting again. That analysis to know, for instance, what does Canon 517.2 say? <laughs> what, what is the history of the female diaconate? What are the, the, um, the tensions around some of these new models of ministry? 
One of the things that also struck me in both gatherings of lay leaders is the number of times they said, can we learn some things from our Protestant brothers and sisters about church polity, church decision making, formation of the clergy, choosing priests and pastors uh, and bishops. Now, as a Catholic, I didn't hear that too often growing up. But to hear them now, and some of these people were quite conservative politically, very conservative politically, but when it came to church structure, they were applying some of their analysis from uh, their occupations and their professions. Now, obviously, our church is not just an organization. It has a divine found, founding, but on one level, it is an organization which is a sacred organization, which means it has to function well in order to fulfill its sacred mission. So I think that what we're doing today, we need to do more of it. Another, quest, another question. Another question is, when? when? When will all this happen? Ask the Holy Spirit. I don't know. I, I can't, uh, I don't know. Um, this is a question about the search for the third institution. And this person is saying, how do we make our parishes more welcoming, particularly to single parents? And so this is a question that I hear across the country. How do we make our parishes welcoming to everyone? How do we make certain that the lectors and the extraordinary ministers and the people who serve in leadership represent the generations in the church? I can remember when I was a teenager, I was asked by the staff of Sacred Heart to be a lector. I don't think I would have ever gone forward myself. It wasn't even in my thinking. So, when did that stop in certain places? When did we stop inviting, stop asking, stop encouraging? That's a piece of this. Not just from leadership of the parish, but from one another. How do we create vibrant faith communities that will go forward into the future? They certainly uh, prepared a lot of us. How do we now think of the next generations after us to make sure they're there for them? So, on that note, let me thank you, and I turn it now to the Vice President. Thank you, Sister Mary. I'd now like to ask uh, Dr. DeMay to come up to give final remarks. Well, thank you, Sister Mary, for this well thought through and beautifully delivered colloquium. Um, the faculty and students in the audience will appreciate Sister Mary has a class tomorrow at Trinity New Washington and she's preparing for final exam next week. So we are so appreciative that you arrange your schedule uh, to be here with us. As a small token of our appreciation, we have this gift for you.
Thank you again, Sister Mary. I want to thank everyone for being here today. You've honored us with your presence for this first annual Reverend Hugh Crean Distinguished Lecture. I see a lot of nurses and scrubs in the back of the room. Nursing students, thanks so much for being here today. Mr. Brzezanski, please uh, thank you again for your presence here today. Um, please, I uh, hope all of you will join us over in the Mary Dooley College Center for a reception. Thank you again, and have a wonderful evening.